yeah, like as you're saying, like the film, the concept, super interesting. Mm -hmm. The context with which this world exists, super interesting. The implications and I guess like observing humanity element to it is interesting. Mm -hmm. Like, because it's like, it's not so far-fetched to think that like people who are trash uh, will do these things uh, yeah. within this hypothetical scenario in which this takes place mm -hmm. uh, and I mean I think there is like an obvious critique even if from 2008 on capitalism and the commodification of human bodies and its parts mm -hmm. that is as lots of people feel like relevant today and to people who exist mm, today financial collapse <laughs> there's yeah, a lot going on um, in 2008 and yeah I think like the way it hit I did not watch it when I was younger, uh, as Gabe did, uh, but I did watch it now. Uh, so it hit me differently than I think it would have maybe 2008 cat. Um, in that, like, I get that it was about kind of the plastic surgery industry, big pharma and the credit industry. Um, but like in the world of a global pandemic <laughs> and like, just like the medical, the way medicine and yeah. big pharma and like exploitative practices has developed um, and has existed as it has for as long as it has made it hit differently for me um, with like es essentially like the blatant exploitation of human bodies and how that's like super relevant and upsetting. Yeah. Um, so essentially for me, a reality where human body parts are purchased and sold with the ever present threat of repossession while that is horrific, it does not seem like a far fetched concept. Mm -hmm. Um, as I live in a society with the commodification of human bodies as something that's relatively commonplace, uh, organs seem like a believable next step, uh, with the system that already values money more than human life. As we kind of like touched on before, I'm considering how the service industry has been actively exploited for profit in a sense of normalcy, like for who, mm -hmm. uh, where life-saving medicine is held behind like locked cabinets and insurance and price walls. I can easily imagine a world where a person just goes around repossessing stuff from people like yep. organs, medicines that would otherwise save their lives, treatments um, mm -hmm. that if they are not able to afford or no longer able to get like that already happens, not the repossession necessarily, but the lack of possession from onset. Um, and even to an extent, like the crippling way in which the medical industry requires such financial compensation for like more than it's actually required uh, for yeah. procedures um, and that people get into like exponentially insane amounts of debt from having kids, from surviving cancer, from surviving anything, honestly, mm -hmm. um, that's like you're surviving so that you have to work s to life threatening levels for the rest of your life to pay off what l allowed you to survive. It doesn't, it doesn't seem practical. <laughs> um, it yeah, it's seems, not an equivalent exchange. Yeah. It's very exploitative. It's purely oriented towards creating more people who are indebted to this capitalistic society and will serve it. Um, ultimately benefiting the people like, uh, what was it? Rody? Yeah. Um, the Trumps of our world, the Bezos is the people who have money and actively hurt people to maintain that. Mm -hmm. Um, and I mean, we've covered medical exploitation like multiple times uh, mm -hmm. in our previous episodes and the layers in which capitalism, the patriarchy and racism all kind of just team up mm -hmm. to work together. Uh, Best buds. Yeah. To oppress people is, as always, super gross and super sad. Um, it is musical time, so it's a little fun, but I can't. I don't know. I can't let people enjoy things, I guess, because this is it's just, the world sucks. Yeah, man. I mean. <laughs> I don't really know how else to say it but uh, the horrors that surround the organ transplant industry specifically which is something I learned about like today uh, or in the research of this episode I did not know like the full depth of what's happening um, it provides our usual dose of wow people suck people are trash this is a trash society and trash people and trash humanity and just ew um, so specifically I guess like to get into it when we look at how organ transplants are decided, 
red flags like immediately stand out specifically like the language used and how transparent recipients are decided is very vague and seems inherently unfortunately because of how the u.s exists um it acts as a way to separate transplant access based on economic and because of the way America is racial terms. Um, in fact, according to the United Network for Organ Sherry, an organ allocation is decided based on the following factors. Um, there's the obvious ones like blood type, medical factors that weigh into the allocation of every organ that is donated but each organ type has its own individual distribution policy which reflects factors unique to each organ type so organs that have more preservation elements to them they can last longer outside of the human body the distance to a hospital is less of a impact but for a lot of them you end up being forced to have to reside near these hospitals and that those factors actually like greatly influence your ability to receive organs. So for example, kidneys, the factors are the largest, like you have the most options when it comes to kidneys, because one, you can receive things from living donors, um, as well as deceased donors. Um, and the factors that go into getting kidney do, or for donation, both for receiving and donating, are a little more loose. Uh, you have waiting time, donor recipient immune system compatibility, prior living donor. So like if you gave a kidney before and you need one now, uh, you're more likely to be able to receive one. Um, distance from donor hospital, uh, as well as survival benefit, which kind of indicates like what is your status currently that would signify that you will likely live a long life um, and pediatric status. So if you are a younger person, you are not an adult, you get extra points in their gauge system um, because you're going to under this assumption that you'll live a longer life and benefit more from this organ because you're young Um when you get to things more like lungs, liver, and hearts, the things that make those organs available to you kind of shortens that list that makes it possible shortens. Um, lungs, you can still have survival benefit, medical urgency play a role, waiting time, as well as pediatric status, um, as well as the kind of consistent one that is always in consideration is distance from donor hospital. So the liver and heart specifically have a very different window of opportunity, if that makes sense. Um, so when thinking about that, there's obvious disparities that kind of exist with the distribution of organs, specifically in, in the necessity for individuals receiving these organs to be near these hospitals. If you think about the fact that it is likely, and based on the data, it does suggest that this is true, um, that most of the hospitals are located away from BIPOC neighborhoods, uh, away from poorer neighborhoods, and are most prevalent in white and uh, affluent neighborhoods. Um, and there's obvious implications of inequity that exist from that fact alone. Um, so economic status also plays a role in reference to location, but it also plays a really big role in reference to like access to insurance um, and ability to pay for these procedures in the first place. Um, but if we're looking at the organs, the ones that exist, like we have the most time kidneys exist, you can have for 24 to 36 hours. Um, they can exist outside of a human body and still be viable for donation. Um, pancreases are 12 to 18 hours as well. And liver is eight to 12 heart and lungs are only four to six hours. So that's where it becomes really important that you are closely located, uh, to these hospitals. The data for organ transplants from dead donors, so people who have it on their license that you can take their organs after they're gone or like have signed up for the donor list post life um, is publicly available and unfortunately seems to support the claim um, to date white Americans have received 10,105 out of the 16,035 total organs that have been donated. Black Americans have received 2,705. Hispanic, Hispanic Americans have received 2,395, Asian Americans 563, American Natives 122, Pacific Islanders 56, 
and multiracial individuals at 88. Um, this list spans from the years 1988 to 2021. This data does not include live kidney transplantation, from what I understand, which holds different but similar, similarly disparaging data. Um, the amount of individuals in need of life-saving organ transplants, according to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, is over 120,000 people who currently occupy a wait list. Um, in an article titled Ethnic Disparities in Liver Transplantation by Nianji Kemmer, the largest disparity in access to these like life-saving procedures is insurance. The article states that all, according to the National Healthcare Disparities Report, health insurance is the key barrier to health care access among Black and Hispanic patients. In the population-based study using the NIS data, Black and Hispanic patients with cirrhosis were less likely to have private insurance, but more likely to be insured by Medicaid than white patients. In a large cohort of potential liver transplantation ca candidates, it was found that a strong association between insurance status and the likelihood of referral for evaluation for liver transplantation existed. In the study, potential candidates with commercial or private insurances were more likely to be referred or evaluated for liver transplantation. And although this study did not provide ethnic-specific data, it provides in insights to the critical role that health insurance specifically plays in affecting like accessibility to these transplants. Um, when it comes to life donors of kidneys, an article from John Hopkins Medicine titled Disparity Persists, racial and ethnic minority patients still less likely than white patients to get live donor kidney transplants written by Shanapa Tanti Ban Chachai. They go through some of these factors that influence these disparities and specifically the findings posted by the American Medical Association showed that in the study, 453,162 adult first-time kidney transplant candidates nationwide exist. Overall, the insist Incidents, I'm sorry, overall the incidence of live donor kidney transplantation increased from 1995 to 2014 among white patients from 7% to 11.4% and among Asian patients 5.1% to 5.6%, but decreased over the same time period among black patients from 3.4 to 2.9 and Hispanic patients from 6.8 to 5.9. The article goes on to outline like the extensive need for life live kidney donation as over 700,000 patients in the U S have currently been diagnosed with end stage kidney disease. Um, with the need, however, there are factors that keep BIPOC candidates both from the recipient as well as the donor pool, um, such as illnesses, such as li high blood pressure, diabetes, and kidney disease that disproportionately affect black and Hispanic communities. Um, a large barrier to donor and recipient status also revolves around this price and the access to insurance. Um, this extends both for like the bill for care as well as like an inability to take days off work for recovery. Um, because of the way that the system exists is that so many people are unable to like survive based on the wages that they have um, and do not have the ability to take days off for things that such as life-saving surgeries. So it's either that or death. Um, and sometimes either way, death is what happens and it's horrible. <laughs> um, but essentially both of these pathways to receiving and donating organs are skewed to favor economically well, more well-off individuals who have private insurance, um, and thus inherently discriminatory towards race and class because of the structure and systems within our country. This is like a lot can be said about organs specifically, but this doesn't even like touch on the fact that there is such a paywall that exists just for basic health needs, annual doctor's visits, uh, such a medicine specialists, things that people need for survival. Uh, the, yeah, big talking points for insulin, inhalers, EpiPens, things that like people need as like restorative ongoing treatment options and that exist behind a paywall that without insurance, lots of people just can't get them. Kids who have asthma just don't get to breathe now. Like that's just the verdict. People won't survive from these 
pay gaps that basically make it impossible for people to afford medicine. Um, as someone who does need medicine to survive, this is like super real. When I lost insurance, I couldn't afford to get my inhalers. Even when I was on insurance, most of my inhalers were like $100 per each one and I need a new one each month. Um, and when you're not making a lot of money, that's really hard to maintain. Yeah. Like imagine children, literal like tiny babies who need inhalers and not even just inhalers, but EpiPens or um, the treat like asthma treatments that extend past inhalers you need like a whole nebulizer machine um those things also are extremely expensive and if you don't cover for grants or qualify for like the specific programs that do aid these issues the moral of the story is that these issues shouldn't exist there shouldn't have to be nonprofits to handle this stuff like it shouldn't cost that much that system should not need a band-aid it should just not exist and it should there should be actual solutions yeah people um, shouldn't die for something that is there like if medicine exists that can keep you alive you should be able to have it that's it yes like no one 100%. should be dying for something that's right there mm -hmm. yeah and i mean it's all super gross it's all super gross and there i said so many sources for this episode and i was not even able to like get through every single one it seems like this is like there is a lot going on in reference to like organs and specifically like the pay gaps between like people's ability to get these procedures. And like the one that upset me the most is just like the fact that most of our population is worked to the point that like they do not get paid enough to live at the end of the day. Um, so they're being forced into these instances of debt or are not even able to get the procedures that they need for survival because they can't not work because they're being paid so little. Um, yeah. And it's all just super gross and upsetting. And I wish it wasn't a thing mm -hmm. uh, in terms of ways to help. I still need to kind of gather my list. Honestly, uh, there are organizations that do raise funds for this. There are nonprofits that exist to try to make this process easier but it's also super upsetting that those nonprofits have to exist and that the government doesn't just do it. Like that the, their job is to help people and they don't. Yeah. There, there shouldn't need nonprofits to do it. Mm -hmm. It just shouldn't exist. Yeah. And it's also um, like, if you're going to cover this topic in your musical about organ repossession, then maybe you should have some BFBOC in it. Um, like Alexa Vega, I believe is, is Latina, but like, <laughs> you know, like white passing for sure. Mm -hmm. And like, where's the rest of them? Like in your post-apocalyptic future, are those, were they the first to go, I guess? Like, and now we're just left with white folks. Uh, yeah. And it's super sad. So it's happy musical time. But also uh, the reality of the world is just like, I had a family member ask me like, why I'm such a downer. <laughs> essentially recently and I was like um it's because I'm always reading about how awful society is um at all moments so how can I be happy optimism time I feel like if anything that just lulls us into a full sense of security and then nothing will ever change um so we yeah. all need to just be really angry always yeah well, it's uh, like somebody's gotta be mad like it, someone's gonna be upset somebody gotta someone's do gonna it. be paying attention that's the mm -hmm. price for paying attention is that you're gonna be mad <laughs> yeah. yeah and like i feel like that happens a lot in all of our episodes and just like people being like it's horror it's fun and then we're like let's tell you about the reality and it's awful mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's just like what we do so um yeah it is what it is i think um and we're going to continue to be that, like, all the time. Yeah. No matter, even if it's happy, fun, musical times, it's still awful. Yeah, I mean, the veil has been lifted at this point. You're not going back. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to. Yeah. yeah. It feels gross. It feels very gross yeah. to even have the... I don't think the option exists, but if it did, like, no. Yeah. And I don't think, like, our show could ever be not that. So... Mm -hmm. <laughs> like hopefully always, you enjoy it friends yeah oh yeah hopefully you're enjoying it make sure you check out our, our show notes for um informations about how to try to protect this uh if you love this film this musical let us know um 
you know, if you go to one of those reenactments, I'd love to see a picture of you dressed up if you did. Uh, Kat and I went to Rocky Horror. Uh, yeah, I would love to go to a reenactment. I feel like it might be better because it's organized in such a way. Yeah, like it might um, be fun. I mm-hmm. could bring out my blind mag again. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> my regular mag. Ordinary mm-hmm. mag. <laughs> Amazing opera singer mag. Like, why isn't yeah. that? Anyway. Uh, yeah. So that's our, our you know, facts-heavy musical episode. We'll have a guest next week, and then we'll have another facts-heavy musical episode. But we're doing musicals for two months, so yeah. I hope you like them. I hope yeah. that you're enjoying them because you watch them before you listen to us. Yeah. And I'm sorry if you hated this one. <laughs> and if you're sad, maybe go listen. Because honestly, when you said that, Gabe, it was like immediately was in my head. Is what can I say? You're, you're welcome. welcome. Yeah. There's um, a lot go of watch Moana. Here. It's super fun. Yeah. That's a good musical. Um, yeah. <laughs> empowering. Representation. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, it's great. Uh, well, with that being said, don't get married. Well, your kids. Yeah. And uh, yeah. just sad. They'll take your kids' organs. Or you're the Ooh. repo person and you... To protect your... They're not protecting by proxy You're actually kid. doing bad. Yeah, don't Maybe do Maybe just don't get married or have kids in this specific instance. Yeah, in this dystopian if, world that we already live in. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to have kids, though, I mean, I'm not going to tell you not to. It's just yeah, more so. But just keep it in mind. Yeah, uh, we could have just this. be aware. It's right around the corner. <laughs> it's happening. It's a little too too soon. Uh, yeah. But yeah, definitely <laughs> remember to like and subscribe and listen to us. Check us out. Uh, we want to hear from you. And yeah. Okay. Goodbye. All right. Bye. Yeah. Assassin. Murder. Monster. Ooh.